Welcome to our virtual parent meeting. I'm Ashley Dar, Grand Oaks Talent Development Teacher. Talent development is what CMS calls gifted education, which is also known as AG or AIG, academically and intellectually gifted. This virtual parent meeting will replace our usual in-person meeting at Curriculum Night. So instead at Curriculum Night, I will be available to answer questions about your kids or if you would just like to stop by to say hi. A little bit about me, this is my 14th year as a TD teacher. Before coming over to Grand Oak, I was the TD teacher at J.D. Washam. I'm from New Jersey. I went to college in Williamsburg, Virginia at William & Mary, and I have my master's in gifted education from the University of Connecticut. Uh, this year, I am an instructor for CMS's Gift Ed, which is a professional development series for CMS teachers and I recently served on our district's gifted plan revision team. My husband, Brian, and I have a dog named Sprinkles, and there we are in the picture together. Uh, this year, I am going to have a private Instagram account that I will use to share pictures of our activities and to celebrate our kids' successes. Hopefully, you received this form home. Um, if you would like another copy of it, there's a link in the description below the video. Please return the form to let me know whether or not I have your permission to post pictures of your child on our Instagram account. Uh, there are steps on the form that you can follow to sign up for an account, and then you'll want to search for us. Uh, my username is Mrs. Star, G-O-E. To ensure that we have only Grand Oak families who can see the photos on the account, I'm asking that after you request to follow me, please send me an email with your username. Um, after I get that email, I'll accept your follow request and then you'll be able to see the pictures. Uh, if you have grandparents, aunts, uncles, you can let me know their usernames also and then I'll accept their follow requests. Okay, so in the upper grades, how does TD work at Grand Oak? Well, we know our kids are gifted all day, every day. And it's a research-based best practice to have gifted kids learning with other gifted kids. And so in third, fourth, and fifth grades, we switch classes so that the kids are with others who are performing above grade level in math and reading. And so for each grade level, I will send you an email every other week to update you on our class activities. And you can also check our Instagram account for pictures. When do I get to see the kids? Well, in third grade, I will get to see them on Tuesdays and Fridays and I'll get to see Mrs. Olmstead's first block and Mrs. Lily's second block for reading. And in math, I will get to work with Ms. Shore's first block and Mrs. Smith's second block. My fourth graders, I'll get to see on Mondays and Wednesdays. Uh, in reading, Mrs. Springs' second block, and in math, Mrs. Kershaw's first block. And then in fifth grade, I'll get to see my fifth graders on Mondays and Thursdays and I am working with Miss Boone's second block and Mrs. Lippard's first block. How do we decide on block placement? Well, at Grand Oak, it's not just gifted identification. That is a piece of it, uh, but we also look at the kid's previous performance, which includes teacher recommendations from the previous year, how the kids did in class, and we look at their test scores. We look at the kid's math scores, which gives us math and reading, um, for third graders, we look at their end of year reading level from second grade, which is a letter of the alphabet. And recently, North Carolina passed a law that kids who score a level five on their math EOG need to research, excuse me, receive advanced services the following year in math. And so that's another piece that we consider when placing the kids. Uh, an important part about block placement is that it's flexible. And so we will communicate with you if it seems that your child would benefit from being in a different class. And after collecting data, we can look at making that move. But we'll be in communication with you if a move is necessary. One of the programs that our kids can participate in is Duke TIP, TIP being the Talent Identification Program. This is available for our fourth and fifth graders, for kids who score at the 95th percentile or higher on their EOGs or math. Um, it's not something that we do at school. 
uh, at the end of the year, Mr. G will recognize the kids who have signed up for the program on the morning news, but otherwise everything is done uh, online or on the weekend. One of the opportunities the kids have with Duke Tip is to take the ACT. And because the ACT is designed for high schoolers, uh, it's an off-level test. And so when it removes the testing ceiling, sometimes we're able to better see what our kids are capable of. Uh, so rather than looking at a third grade test or a fifth grade test, when they go and take a test designed for high schoolers, it gives us a little bit more clear picture of their abilities. We are at Cambridge School. Um, one of the important parts about Cambridge is that we want our kids to develop as thinkers. And so if you've been at Grand Oak before, you will probably notice a connection to our PL, or Personalized Learning Characteristics. Um, we are preparing the kids as problem solvers and critical thinkers. Here are the five ways that your children can be identified as gifted in CMS. I would be happy to talk with you about whether or not your child is identified as gifted and if they are, uh, which label they fall under. Um, again, at Grand Oak, gifted identification is one piece that we consider in determining the kids' block placement, but we also look at their performance. So not everyone in that block will be identified gifted, but they have shown a high class performance. Um, if you look at these descriptors, descriptors uh, you can see that the first three are looking at that high intellectual capacity performance in both math and reading. And the last two will be single subject only. And so a child can identify in both math and reading or just math or just reading. And again, I'd be happy to talk with you about your individual kids. So testing and, and identification. Once your child is identified, uh, through TD, they will keep that identification throughout their CMS career. They don't need to retest um, for gifted. We test every second grader and there are multiple options for identification including a portfolio. If you have a fourth grader who is not identified but is performing well above average in class, the classroom teachers and I will discuss testing and we'll look at the kids class performance and EOG scores. Um, and once again, the kids can be identified in reading or math or both. If your child is not identified as gifted and you would like him or her to take the COGAT, um, you can let me know and we will look at your kid's scores from last year's EOGs with the identification rubric to see if he or she is eligible to test. Um, this would apply only to fourth and fifth graders because the kids' COGAT scores are valid for 24 months. Um, our third graders who took the COGAT in second grade are not eligible to retest. So we wait until fourth or fifth grade. Um, so if your child's not identified and you'd like them to take the COGAT, and if they don't have a minimum of four points on the identification rubric, which I'll show you next, um, you can put together three work samples that show your child is performing well above grade level. Um, and our school's TD committee will review the work samples and will let you know if it seems that testing is the best option for your child. Um, those work samples are due to me at the beginning of November and then testing takes place in December and January across CMS. Um, I'd be happy to talk with you more about what the work samples could look like for your child. It doesn't need to be an elaborate volcano project. Uh, it, it would be great to see a page from a math notebook that shows the child's thinking and the, the number sense or maybe a paragraph um, that would showcase the child's advanced vocabulary. So it's the small pieces of work that show their advanced uh, skills. And again, I'd be happy to talk with you individually if you have questions. So this is the identification rubric. Um, this is new this year. It's part of our revised gifted plan with the state, and this breaks down how a child is able to identify as gifted through different avenues. And so uh, all second graders take the COGAT, and then some second graders take the Iowa assessment. Uh, so the COGAT is going to be all the way to the left in the aptitude column. The Iowa or the EOG end of grade test will be in the achievement column, and it's different ways that the kids can accumulate points for gifted identification. Um, I'd be happy to talk with you about where your child is on this rubric um, 
if that applies to you. So now we'll talk about the kids' social and emotional needs. Um, in my opinion, if we don't meet their social and emotional needs, then there is no point in attempting to meet their intellectual needs. Uh, perfectionism is something that uh, we see, and I know you see at home too. Uh, perfectionism is not a bad thing. Sometimes we expect it, um, for example, from a surgeon or from a pilot. But with our kids, we want to make sure that we are seeing healthy perfectionism and less of the unhealthy perfectionism. So we want our kids to set high goals and to do the best that they can, but we don't want them to feel like their work is never good enough. Um, three aspects of perfectionism that I see um, that dichotomous thinking. So if I'm never going to get my room perfectly organized, why should I even bother making my bed? Uh, it's, it's all or nothing. If my project is not perfect, then it is worthless. Uh, another point about perfectionism is when our kids transform their wants into musts. So I want to do well on my math test becomes, well, I have to get 100 or I have failed. Uh, and the third part is focusing on unmet challenges. So maybe I have completed most of an assignment and I have plenty of time to finish the rest of it, but I'm going to perseverate on the part that I haven't finished and just be extremely anxious about it. Um, there's a, a link down below if you wanna click there and get some more information about helping gifted kids uh, cope with perfectionism. Lisa Van Gemmert uh, has an interesting level strategy. So her book, uh, Perfectionism, A Practical Guide to Managing Never Good Enough, has a really interesting level strategy. So there are five levels, and it has to do with the amount of effort that you put forth. So a level one is a task that needs to be done, but not necessarily well. So for example, making your bed. Um, you need to get the pillows and the blankets off the floor, but it doesn't have to be Pinterest worthy. Level two is going to be a little more time and skill than a level one. So cleaning the toilet. Um, it needs to be cleaned to a standard, but there's more than one way to do it, and it doesn't take that long. Uh, this at school would be like a math practice worksheet. So you need to practice the skills, but the paper doesn't have to be immaculate. It's okay if there are some eraser marks on it. Uh, and it's not going to take all of your brain power to complete it. Level three is going to take a little more time, effort, and practice. So that would be like washing the dishes, because if you don't do it well, then you can get sick, or an in-class assignment. So it's something that you have to focus on to complete um, more than, say, the math practice problem sheet. Now a level four is going to be more time, effort, or skills than the previous levels. So that might be like performing in a play um, where you're going to have lots of preparation and effort for a bigger school project. So it's something that takes more time and counts for more of a grade. Now, importantly, level four is the highest that a school assignment can be. We won't do anything at school that's a level five because a level five means that something critically important is at stake. So that would be taking your medicine as directed, being at a relative's wedding, uh, something that if you make a mistake or if you don't do it, you're going to have huge consequences. Um, something that's also critically important would be a test that would determine if you get into the college of your dreams. If this is something that's extremely important to you, um, then it's worth making a plan, putting in time, and worrying a little. But our perfectionists need to be reminded that most activities are not level fives. And so when you get something home, an assignment to work on, it's not a level five. If it's from school, it won't be higher than a level four, and it's okay to have eraser marks on it. Okay, on the other hand, sometimes we see underachievement from kids. Uh, and this is where a kid's expected achievement does not match what they're, we're actually seeing. So an expected achievement is measured by an ability or an aptitude test. An actual achievement is measured by class grades and teacher evaluations. Now, underachievement can definitely be linked to perfectionism, so they're not uh, completely different, but uh, underachievement is a pattern. So it's also, it's not performance on just one assignment. We would be looking at a pattern from kids. So 
what happens when kids expected achievement doesn't match what they're actually doing? Well, doctors Del Sigley and Betsy McCoke from the University of Connecticut have looked at some possible missing pieces. And so for motivation, sometimes the kid's motivation is, is missing. So they may not see the task as meaningful. Why would I have to do it? Um, they may not have the self-efficacy, feel that they are able to succeed. And also the kid's environmental perception. So does my teacher or do my parents think that I'm able to succeed in this task? Um, and then we also want to look at the kid's self-regulation. And so are they able to get done what they need to get done? So these are the missing pieces that we look at when we see someone's achievement uh, potential is not matching what they're actually doing. There's a link um, to this article in the description below the video, and it's worth checking out. Um, again, it's by Drs. Del Sigley and Betsy McCoach, and they have some interesting tips about motivating your high-ability child. We're also going to look at some overexcitabilities, or OEs. This is part of Dabrowski's theory of positive disintegration. Now, overexcitabilities are not unique to gifted individuals, but it's more common for gifted people to have them than in the general population. So just because someone has overexcitabilities does not make them gifted. And just because someone's gifted does not mean that they will have these overexcitabilities. But we do see some overlap in the population. There are five categories of overexcitabilities. Uh, the first one, psychomotor. These are the kids who have that extra energy. They are always on the go. They are not sitting still. Uh, the sensual overexcitability, which is when you have a heightened awareness of the five senses. Uh, so maybe the tags in your clothes bother you, or the seam on your socks. Uh, maybe the cafeteria is just too loud, or there's a certain smell. Um, intellectual overexcitability. It's the kid whose wheels are constantly turning in their brains. They're just constantly thinking. Emotional overexcitability. Uh, these are the kids who have big emotions. Um, they have sometimes anxiety or concern for others, and they, they show their emotions throughout their whole body. And then imaginational overexcitability. These are kids who maybe have imaginary friends, um, they have vivid fantasies, they are constantly asking what if, and they may imagine the worst case scenarios and continue to ask you questions about that. So here's some more information about the five categories of overexcitabilities. Uh, Michael Pihovsky's Mellow Out, They Say, If Only I Could, is a great book, and he talks about how these overexcitabilities affect gifted kids. Asynchronous development. Um, we know that our gifted kids are exceptional learners. They can think abstractly, they have advanced vocabulary, they have cognitive complexities, and often are talented in multiple areas. And so because we see these exceptionalities, sometimes we think that, well, they must also have strong organization and self-regulation skills. And because they have these cognitive complexities, surely they can also handle complex emotional situations, including making friends. Um, and sometimes we also just assume that these kids are mature and can naturally teach others. And so at this point, you've figured out that these are not necessarily true, right? So asynchronous development, just because a child has developed at an advanced level cognitively or intellectually, doesn't mean that his or her other skills are at that level. And so sometimes we see it with kids' fine motor skills. Um, you might have a five-year-old who can read on a third grade level, but isn't able to tie shoelaces, right? And so we want to think about just because a child is advanced in an intellectual area doesn't necessarily mean that all of the other areas are also that advanced. And so we want to make sure we're giving supports for our kids. Uh, for part two, I'm going to talk more about the curriculum that we'll be learning this year. And so you can click the link below for part 